This lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will be about Burnside's lemma. So for motivation for Burnside's lemma, we will look at the following problem. Um, arrange eight rooks on a chessboard with one rook in each row and column. In other words, the rooks have to be not attacking each other. So we've got an eight by eight board looking something like this. And what we have to do is just select a square from each row and column so that um, none of these are in the same row or the same column. So we might do it something like this. So that would be one possible arrangement. And the problem is how many ways are there, are there of doing this? And this is rather easy because there are eight ways we can choose the rook in the first um, row. And once we've chosen the rook in the first row, the rooks in the other row can't be in the same column. So there are now seven ways to choose the rook in the second row. And again, we have to delete this column. So now there are six ways to choose the rook in the third row. And you can see how this is going. We get eight times seven times six times five times four, times three times two times one, which is 40320 possibilities. So that's rather easy. Uh, a more interesting problem is how many ways are there of doing this up to symmetry? So if we rotate the board, we get a different arrangement. But we don't want to count that as different. We want to count it as being the same. So we can ask how many up to symmetry? And this problem was solved by um, Lucas. Um, in his book, Theory um, of Numbers. It's volume one, page 222, if you want to look it up. Um, so um, the, the, the key point is to use group theory. So your first guess might be just to take the number of arrangements and divide by the order of the group of symmetries. So, so the number of symmetries of, an, uh, uh, of a square is just eight. So we might try dividing that by eight because you might think each arrangement is, is in a group of eight. The trouble is there are some arrangements that are symmetric under some symmetries. For instance, if we took all the rooks lying down the diagonal, then we wouldn't get eight different arrangements from that. We would only get two. So you have to somehow um, account for the fact that some of the arrangements are symmetrical. So to do this, we're going to use something called Burnside's lemma. Um, so what we have is, is we have a group, uh, the dihedral group of order eight acting on a set of size Four zero three two zero, and we want to know how many orbits. You remember two elements of a set actually on by the group are in the same orbit if there's an element of the group taking one to the other. So asking for the number of different arrangements up to symmetry is just the same as asking for the number of orbits. More generally, if we've got a group G acting on a set S, we can ask how many orbits there are. And Burnside's lemma says the number of orbits is equal to the average number of fixed points. So this is the average we, we sum over one over the order of the group G of um, SG where SG is the number of elements of S fixed by G, 
fixed by the element g. In other words, this just means g s equals s. Um, so Burnside's lemma um, is named after um, this guy Burnside and comes from his book, Theory of Groups of Finite Order. You can see the his statement of the lemma here. Let me just magnify it a bit so you can read it. So here he's saying the number the sum of the number of symbols left unchanged by each of the permutations of a group of order n, that, that, that's taking a sum over all elements of the group of the number of fixed points, and he's saying that's equal to t times n, where t is the number of orbits and n is the number of elements of the group. Um, well, Burnside's lemma well, was not originally due to Burnside. It seems to be one of these lemmas that was discovered by absolutely everybody working on group theory in the 19th century. So it was certainly known to people like Cauchy and Frobenius before Burnside um, used it. Anyway, um, it's fairly easy to prove. So let's just look at the proof. What we do is we look at, at the number of pairs G, S with G S equals S. So here G is in the group G and S is in our set S. And we can count this in two different ways. First of all, um, we can count by summing over um, elements G. So, so we just have to sum over all elements of G. And for each element of G, the number of possible elements S is just the number of points of S fixed by G. So remember this is points fixed by the element G. On the other hand, we can count the number by first summing over all elements S. So we sum over all S and for each element S, um, we take G S, where this is the um, where G S is the subgroup fixing 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 the element S, and um, G S is just the um, size of G divided by the size of the orbit of S. Remember if if G acts on a set, um, then G is equal to the size of the set times the subgroup fixing one element. So we can write this as a sum over all orbits um, of the size of the orbit times the order of G, that should be the order of G, divided by the size of the orbit. So instead of summing over um, elements of S, we're going to um, sum, we're going to divide the elements of S into orbits, and we just sum over the orbits, and for each orbit we take the number of elements in the orbit and multiply it by this element here. And this is just the sum over all orbits of the order of G, which is equal to G times the number of orbits. And if you compare this expression with this expression, all you have to do is to divide both sides by the order of G. So the number of orbits is equal to 1 over G times sum over G of S to the G, which is the average number of fixed points. Um, so now we're going to apply this to our problem. So first of all, we have to work out what are the elements of the group D8. So we said this has eight elements, and we can just write them all out as follows. First of all, there's, there's the identity element, which does absolutely nothing to the square. And then we've got an element that sort of flips it like this. 
And there's another element which is very similar, which kind of flips it about a horizontal instead of a vertical axis. So these, these are flips about horizontal vertical axes. Um, then we can also flip it around a diagonal axis. So we can either flip these two corners or we can flip these two corners. And we can also rotate it. So we can rotate it clockwise or anti-clockwise. And finally, there's one more thing we can do. We can just rotate it by 180 degrees, which means we flip these two corners and these two corners. Well, so that gives eight elements, but we don't really need to do all eight elements because if you look at these two elements here, you can see that these are really equivalent. They're going to have the same number of fixed points. And similarly, these two have the same number of fixed points, and these two have the same number of fixed points. So we can divide the elements up into, well, these are called conjugacy classes. So what is a conjugacy class? Well, an informal definition means um, we say two elements are conjugate, Um, if they sort of look the same. Okay, this is this is a sort of obviously not a strict mathematical definition, but it works most of the time. If two elements kind of look the same, then they're called conjugate. Well, let's have a more precise mathematical definition. Um, because we obviously can't prove theorems about things that sort of look the same. So why do these two sort of look the same? Well, um, um, so the first one is flipping around a vertical axis, and the second one is flipping around a horizontal axis. And you can turn the vertical axis into a horizontal axis by applying one of these transformations here. So if I, if I, if I pick an element, suppose I call this element G, and this element A and this element B, you can see you can get A by first rotating by 90 degrees and then applying B and then undoing the 90 degree rotation you had. So, so these two elements look the same because they're related like this. And this is, this is the official definition of conjugacy. So we say A and B are called conjugate if a equals g b g to the minus one for some g in the group g and you can see this is an equivalence relation using the axioms for a group and the equivalence classes are just the conjugacy classes So this reduces the amount of work we have to do. Instead of looking at eight elements, we only have to look at five. Um, reducing from eight to five isn't that big a deal, but for bigger groups, the number of conjugacy classes can be far less than the number of elements of the group. So this can save a lot of effort. Um, so now let's um, solve our problem by summing over all the elements of G. So Let's write out the elements of G. Oops, a clean piece of paper. So here, here are the conjugacy classes. And here are the number of elements in the conjugacy class. So first of all, we've got the identity element and there's one element in the conjugacy class. And here's the number of fixed points. So the, 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 the number of arrangements fixed by the identity, we've worked this out before, it's just eight factorial, which is four, zero, three, two, zero. Um, next, we have the conjugacy class consisting of things like this or this. 
And here there are two elements in the conjugacy class. And the number of fixed points is pretty obviously zero because if we've got a rook in the first row, then under this transformation, there would have to be another rook in the first row, which isn't allowed. So we just get zero there. That's nice and easy. What about this one? So I'm going to flip two opposite corners. And now there's one element in this conjugacy class. What's the number of fixed points? Well, we can choose any, we can, we can choose a rook in the first row. That gives us eight possibilities. Well, then that will also determine a rook in the bottom row. So, so we've we sort of determined two rooks and those will knock out two columns. For the second row, there are then going to be six possibilities. And the rook in the seventh, second row will then determine a rook in the seventh row. And that will again knock out two columns. So in the third row, we have four possibilities. And in the fourth row, we have two possibilities. So we get 384 ways of doing that. Um, if we rotate by a quarter of a revolution or back the other way, there are two of these. And now how many? Well, we first put a rook in the first row. Well, it can't be in the corner because then there would have to be another rook in this corner, which would be in the same row. So they can't be in the corners, but they can be anywhere else, which gives us six possibilities. And if we choose one of these, we get four other rooks, which leaves us four rows and four columns. And again, we can't choose a rook in the corner of those four columns. So we have two possibilities. So altogether, there are 12 ways of arranging like this. The final one is a little bit trickier to work out. So there are two um, conjugacy classes. And now let Cn be the number of arrangements on an n by n board. Then we see that Cn is equal to Cn minus 1 plus n minus 1 Cn minus 2. The reason for this is we can choose the first rook to be either in this corner. Let's suppose we're doing we're doing this arrangement, um, in which case we then have to arrange C. We then have to arrange n minus one rooks in uh, down here, or we can choose it not in the first corner, so somewhere else. So there are n minus one other ways to put it in the first row. We then, it then determines another rook in the first column. So we knock out two rows and two columns, and we have C n minus two ways of arranging the rooks in the remainder. So from this, we can work out what C n is. We have C naught, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and C8. And C0 and C1 are easy. They're both just one. So we can work these out as 1, 2, 4, 10, 26, 76, 232, and 764. So here we have 764 possibilities. And now we just multiply the number of elements in each conjugacy class by the number of fixed points. So we get 40320 there, we get zero there. We get 768 here, we get 24 there. And we've got 1528 there. Now we add these up and we get 42256. Then we take 42256 divided by the order of G, which is 8. And the final answer we get is 5282. So this is the number of ways of arranging eight rooks on a chessboard up to symmetry. So the next lecture, we will look at groups of order nine.